We are in Ephesians chapter 4. So we continue our study through the, the book of Ephesians. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the time we got to spend um, lifting your, your name up, Lord, but also remembering the sacrifice, Lord, that you, uh, that you gave for us. Lord, as Tim uh, said, it's not just a ritual. It's not just something you have to do um, to be saved. It's not just part of the program once you're saved, Lord. Um, but it's something that we must constantly come back to. And so, Lord, I thank you for that time together as the body where we can do that in remembrance of you. And now, Lord, as we come together again um, around your word, we pray that your word would go out um, as you've declared it, that your Holy Spirit would teach us the things that you desire to show us, that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. Fill me right now, Lord, to, to preach your word. We pray that you'd be honored and glorified. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So starting in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 4, that's where we left off last week, Paul goes on and says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, it's not Christmas. In fact, we'll be, um, as I mentioned, celebrating Easter here uh, um, in a minute or in a couple weeks. Um, but it's not Christmas, but there are gifts for us today. In fact, um, yesterday I was speaking with my oldest son and um, we were uh, cleaning up our, our house and uh, doing some work on it. And uh, I told him if he helps me out, I'd go buy him a Lego set um, because, you know, he does exactly as I tell him and everything. And so he's all excited and goes, Dad, I'm getting a gift and, and it's, it's not Christmas and it's not my birthday and it's not Easter because those are the three days that you get gifts, right? <laughs> Well, right now we actually have gifts as child, as God's children. Every morning waking up, it's like walking down stairs and seeing the tree filled with presents. And that, oh, at least that's how it should be. That's certainly what he set up for us. But he has given us gifts. But the question we have is, what do we do with them? Here Paul is going to speak on what the gifts are for and how that relates to us as he's been speaking in chapter 4, walking worthy of our calling. If you remember last week, he prefaced um, what he's about to list out on how we're supposed to live as believers with walking worthy of your calling. And then he's going to list what does that look like. So continuing that theme, he's going to talk about gifts this morning. So going back to verse 7, Paul says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, in the past three chapters, as, as we've seen, Paul has um, spoken about these amazing truths about Christ and what that means to us. And now he's taking the turn for the practical. 
Now that we know these truths, now that we know who Christ is, who we are in Christ, remember that word in Christ, in Him, is something you see a lot in the first three chapters, especially of Ephesians. Now that we know where we are, now that we know who we are, Paul's going to say, this is what that should, now this is how you should look. And last week, we saw that he spoke on both, we just mentioned it, walking worthy of the calling, and then striving for the unity of the church. Paul, Paul was laying it on us saying, you need to endeavor for the unity of the church, the unity of the body. It's something that every believer needs to be doing to trying to, to be together, to have fellowship, to keeping the unity in the body of Christ. But now he's going to kind of break that up a little bit, the unity part. Um, he's going to say, now this is what unity looks like separately, but together. In regard to unity, Paul doesn't want what most of us think of when we think of unity. Typically, when we think of unity, we think of everyone looking the same, everyone doing the same team with the same you know, shirt on, um, doing it, you know, looking the same, acting the same, talking the same. That is unity. That's what a lot of, that's what the world thinks, right? Let's just all sing around Kumbaya and the, the campfire and everything and let's all um, look the same, talk the same. But that's not what Paul says unity is. Paul says unity is a group of unique people who have been given different jobs, but for the same purpose. It's all going to be for the same purpose. In fact, I don't know if that, um, and if you've seen this. If not, it's a, it, it's a, it, you certainly probably know the story of the 1980 um, USA hockey team, men's hockey team. Um, <coughs> You know, they defeated Russia up in Lake Placid, and it was like, yeah, take that, you commies. You know? <laughs> well, um, in the movie, and, and, and actually, too, in real life, when they were getting the team together, there was a lot of people in the Olympic Committee that were really upset with the coach at the time um, because the coach wasn't taking the star players. Uh, at the time, they weren't allowed to take people from the NHL. They were only allowed to take amateur people. But they weren't taking, you know, they had tryouts. And some of the coaches were like, oh, yeah, that guy's really good. And, and the head coach was like, no, I don't want him. And, and, there's, and he's starting some other guys. And they're like, why are you starting this guy? This other guy's a lot better. And he goes, I have a plan. I have a purpose. And, and come to find out, it was because it wasn't about having all the best people. It was about having the right people to do a specific job for one person purpose which is to win the game in a lot of ways that's what christ has done with us as the church he doesn't have the best people in here hate to break it to you (laughs) we are not the cream of the crop (laughs) but god has us here specifically doing different things as specific roles for specific purposes So Paul says here in verse 7 that to each one of us individually grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. What he's really speaking of is that God has given to each one of us individually based on the work of Christ different jobs, different gifts, different talents, different abilities, different roles. None's, no, not one is better than the other. But they are different. And then in keeping with the theme of grace, not works, notice at the end of there, that verse, that it's according to the measure of Christ's gift. It's not according to the measure of our works. It's not according to the measure of how many times we prayed yesterday. Or, or it's not according to the measure of how much work we put in ourselves. It's according to the measure of Christ's gift. Which is when we think about gifts, when we think about talents, it's hard not to think about ourselves. Say, for example, um, and I'm not picking on the worship leaders or anything, but um, that's a really easy one to to point at. Um, With playing music, right? You have to practice. You can't just, you know... 
you know, all week, not pick up the guitar, not pick out your songs, just walk up here and say, yeah, I got to just strum a few of this, a little of that. In fact, myself, I'm not a worship leader. I am, I would say I'm not even a guitar player, but I can make sounds on it. <laughs> and I used to, uh, at, at our old church in California for the youth group, I used to uh, a lot of times do worship because I was the only one available. <laughs> and so, um, I would do worship, and I hadn't played in years, and I think it was a couple months ago, um, uh, Ben let me uh, borrow his guitar. I had it at, at our house, and I went to play it, and I was like, yeah, I haven't practiced at all. <laughs> it's been years, and there's a difference. But you have to practice. You have to put some work into it, some effort into it. Some people, too, it also comes kind of natural, you know. Um, some people, they can just pick up an instrument, and boom, they're just going, and, and they, oh, I've never played this before. And you're like, what? <laughs> so it's really easy with gifts and talents to look at ourselves and be like, well, yeah, I was just born that way. You know, that I was just born with this natural gift and ability. Or, or maybe it's, yeah, they just, they're really um, studious. They put in a lot of effort. They put in a lot of hard work. So that's why they have that gift and that talent. But Paul wants us, Christ wants us to not look at it that way. He wants to look at it. It's according to the measure of Christ's gift. It's according to what he's done, not according to what we've done. Now, if um, I'm not going to touch too much on this, but that certainly doesn't take away from what Jesus says with the, the parable of the, of the talents and the good stewards, that we need to be good stewards of, of what the <laughs> gifts he's given us. But um, that's another teaching for another day. So we'll continue on in verse 8. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So Paul here is quoting actually from Psalm 68, which was written by David. And both Paul and David are highlighting um, the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Which is interesting to think about when you think about personal gifts and talents and abilities. When we think about the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus, particularly we're thinking about salvation, that moment that we get saved, that moment we repent. In fact, um, throughout... Throughout Christianity, I mean, again, we're, we, we see it now, especially in our, our huge commercial church culture, you know, two weeks away, um, you, you're going to hear it on the radio, you're going to see it on billboards, you're going to see it all over town, um, where Easter is this big event where we celebrate Christ's resurrection. And I'm not taking away from that. We should celebrate Christ's resurrection. But it shouldn't be that one Sunday a month that happens to land on the calendar, Or it's the same with um, the birth of Jesus. I remember the first time that, it, it, that I thought it was odd, and then I realized I'm odd, but I thought it was odd when I, was, I went into a Bible study and they were studying the birth of Jesus, and it was like August. I'm like, I thought you were only supposed to talk about this on Christmas time. I thought you were supposed to set that aside for the Advent season. And then you got your other things that you speak about. Like, you know, you got 66 books here. Why are you speaking on the birth of Jesus in August when, you know, you, you're going to speak on it in December again? And we kind of set those things aside. The death, the no death, yeah, Good Friday. We're going to celebrate the death of Christ on Good Friday. The rest of the, the, the year will tell you how to be a good person. But what Paul, what David is doing here in in relation to gifts is that anything we have in this life, gifts, talents, abilities, is centered, founded, and provided by these things, which is the gospel message. The gospel message wasn't for yourself 20 years ago when you got saved at that camp. The gospel message is for you every single day to remember the death the resurrection, the incarnation of Jesus. That He came down as a man from heaven. He came down from heaven to be a man. To be a baby. 
to grow up under parents and submit to them, the same parents he created. I mean, he, you know, Jesus, he could have done like Jedi mind tricks on his mom every time she told him to clean his room. Like, no, you'll clean my room. <laughs> but he didn't. He submitted to her authority. And so Paul here is highlighting that that Christ didn't just give these gifts. It, it, it cost him something to give these gifts. It's not a re-gifting. I mean, I think I'm not going to ask for hands, but I know we all have re-gifted something. <laughs> just a fact of life, right? You get that Tupperware set. Thanks, Aunt Carol. <laughs> And you're like, oh, good thing that work Christmas party is coming up because I got a gift already. It didn't cost me anything. What Paul is highlighting here is even the gifts that we have cost Christ something. Cost the Father something. But but more so than that, When he ascended on high in Psalm 68, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This is actually speaking the same kind of language of a victor who's coming back into town after defeating the enemy. He's, you know, and in those days they would have these huge parades and processionals and, and they would you know, show off the great army that they are. They would show off the great spoils that they got and then they would show off the prisoners that they took. You know, it would be a big hoorah. And then a lot of times they would kind of distribute some of those gifts, some of those spoils. Now when you go to pray, they just like throw candy at you. It's like stale. But this is speaking of Christ when he has finally defeated death. As it says, when he's led captivity captive, when he's finally taken the reins over. He's broken the the chains of bondage of our sin. It's speaking of him walking into town and just blessing us with all these gifts, all these spoils. And if he has done all these things, if he's come down, he died, he conquered death, he rose again, and then he ascended back, as you see in Acts chapter 1, he ascended back... um, to the Father. If He has done all these things, then why couldn't He give us these unique gifts so that we can share in His victory? And this is what Paul is calling uh, the Ephesian church to do. And that's what He's calling us to do. To share in these unique gifts that He's given us. And then in verse 11, He's going to list, list what these are. And He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, these are the specific offices that Christ has given. Um, But these aren't the only gifts. Paul only mentions just a few of the spiritual gifts that people can have. Um, And in this section, he's really um, speaking of specific offices, uh, really of the church, of the body. But you can also go to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. And Romans 12, verses 3 through 8, for some more that are listed. But, but even then, um, that is not the exhaustive list of gifts. Right? I, I don't think in Paul's day they would have listed, um, you know, a, a tech whiz as a gift of the church. Nowadays, we see that as a huge gift of the church. But if, if, if God said, and, and, and you might have the gift of, of setting up web pages and recording, this, they'd be like, huh? It's not the exhaustive list. I think there's very many gifts, very unique gifts for a lot, for, for every, the Bible says for every single person. But first, as we have listed here, is the apostles. Now the apostles that he's speaking of, these were those that that day were charged by the Lord himself to go out and start the church. You know, his disciples. Um, And in Acts chapter 1, we also have the qualifications of an apostle. And one thing to note of that 
is that the office of an apostle was not succeeded by anyone. When we went through the book of Acts, it wasn't like as it time went on, there was more apostles and more apostles and more apostles. Paul wasn't laying his hands on people saying, now you're an apostle and you're an apostle. You know, People weren't coming up to him saying, I am apostle so-and-so. But when Paul would speak about the apostles, they knew ex- everyone knew exactly who those group of people were. One of the main qualifications for um, being an apostle as you see in Acts 1, is that they had to see the Lord both before he died and after he died. Anyone here part of that? (laughs) Nope, I didn't think so. Um, So this office of apostles was something that was unique to the church at that time. It's not something we have today. Now certainly the the other people say, well, apostle just means sent one. And if you really want to feel like you're someone, you can call yourself an apostle and, you know, uh, if it makes you sleep better at night, um, knowing that you call yourself an apostle. Yes, we are all sent ones by God. But the office of apostle was something that was reserved for these few men that the Lord used at the beginning of the church. And so Paul is saying that these people God has given to be apostles. Some apostles. The next is prophets. These were those. Now, uh, Really, when we think of prophets, we typically think of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jonah, um, Daniel, you know, guys who are like yelling at people, telling them to repent, you know, guys who are dealing with these really crazy visions like Ezekiel, where, you know, he might want to check what he was eating the night before because there's just gnarly stuff in there. John, you know, he's seen the revelation and, and there's all these visions, all these things happening for us. A lot of times that's the picture of a prophet that we have in our head. For the New Testament, prophets had a little bit different of a role. And, and it's not that um, necessarily they were different people, but they just did things differently. See, apostles, the prophets in the Old Testament, all they were doing was declaring the Word of God. This is the word of God. And, you know, a few years, the Chaldeans are coming down and you're going to be led captive. Or there's going to be famine. Or there's going to be this. Or there's going to be that. Or I'm going to interpret a dream for you. Whatever it might be. This is what the word of the Lord is. Thus saith the Lord, right? Well, in the New Testament, they did the same thing because they didn't have the New Testament written. You know, they didn't show up in in the Ephesian church and say, well, let's turn to Ephesians 5. (laughs) Hadn't been written yet. They were, they were Well, they were reading it. They didn't know it was Ephesians 5 or anything like that. So the prophets in those days, they were the ones who would just simply declare the word, word of the Lord. And there are many who believe that the office of a prophet is, is no longer around today. Um simply because now the New Testament, the Bible is complete, it's canonized and we have it, that that we don't need to be going around with our Bibles closed saying, thus saith the Lord, and there's some new revelation. I mean, the Bible speaks against that. But there are still those that declare what the Lord says, and that is actually who's listed last here. Um, These last three, well, two people. The evangelist is the next one. Now, these are not just the ones that do great big crusades and stadiums or ones who go around passing out tracts to people or with the bullhorns on the side of the road. Those aren't evangelists, per se. Sometimes they, you know, um, obviously guys like Billy Graham, D.L. Moody, guys like that, Greg Laurie, they are evangelists. They're out doing, doing that. But what Paul is speaking about here in in the context of the church, these are those that desire to reach out to the lost and present the gospel to them. Those that have that calling. And, and, you know, uh, well, I'll use him as an example because um, he's not listening. But uh, you all know Aaron Garcia, right? Our missionary in Nepal and India. When I first met him and started hanging out with him, and I'll tell you, he... When you speak about the gift of evangelism, that's the first person I always think of. You know, he wasn't this weird guy walking around, you know, like pointing his finger at people. You know, the Lord? All right, no. You know, and, uh, you know, see a puddle and be like, hey, let's baptize you. What's, what's hindering you from being baptized? You know, nothing crazy like that. 
but he just had a heart to to anyone we had in co- come came in contact with. And and I, you know, at the time we were in Bible college, and I'd be like embarrassed. We'd be like at the mall, and I'd be like, you know, at, like looking at shoes or something, and I'd be like, yeah, can I get a size ten in this? And and I, as the guy's like, yeah, and then Aaron would go, hey, bro, like, do you ever think about like heaven? And I'm like, can you get my shoes first? <laughs> you know. <laughs> But he has just a heart, and I mean, he still does. And, and, and he's, he's really shown me exactly what that heart should, should look like. But, you know, he wasn't there with a bullhorn. He just had a heart to see the lost saved. And the Lord, and, and again, I, we'd sit there, and, the guy, and, you know, the guy would be sitting there with his, the shoe that I wanted in his hand. He'd be like, no, I haven't. And, and Aaron would sit there and talk to him about it, and I still didn't get my <laughs> shoes. But it, it, it was, it was amazing just to see that. And and I remember telling him like, and you know, I, I, not thus saith the Lord, but I really think that you are an evangelist. Like you've really been given that gift of evangelism. Um, however, some might think, okay, well, good for Aaron. That's not me. Some might think that since this is not your specific gift then you're off the hook from sharing the gospel. You know, all right, well, you know, the, I'll say, I'll let the gospel sharing be done to the evangelist. That's why I invite people to church and don't share my faith because I'll let the pastor do it because, you know, they're better at it. But as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 5, he tells him, even though Timothy's specific gift was pastoring and teaching and shepherding the flock, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Basically, share your faith. Share the gospel. Have that heart for the lost that you should. That even though God has gifted some to really be good at that, still do the work of an evangelist. A really easy way to look at it too is there are certain people that God has gifted with the ability and talent to sing and lead worship. But that does not exclude us from joining in and singing with them, right? That's not my gift to sing It's not, but I'm still to sing and lift the Lord's name on high and worship Him. And it's the same thing with evangelism. That might not be our specific gift, but the Lord still wants us to take part in it. And really, I think that goes with all the gifts. It might not be your specific, oh, you know, I'll I'll stay out of that. You know, my specific gift isn't hospitality. Certainly, some people have been gifted with that. But the Bible is very clear that as Christians, we should all be hospitable. Caring for others. And so even it might not be your specific gift, I think every gift is something that every Christian should have some part of, doing some part of. And then the last thing that he mentions is pastors and teachers. Now, when you read this in the the English version, which I, I think we all are, not the, not the original Greek. It seems like two separate offices. But they're in fact one and the same. When Paul is writing this, he's speaking about the same thing, um, pastors and teachers. He's speaking here of shepherds, those that oversee the flock of God, and then he's also speaking of the shepherds that nourish it through the teaching of the Word of God. I mean, imagine... Uh, whether it's your parent or a shepherd. <laughs> Imagine a shepherd, all he does is watch the flock. Yeah, I, I watched the flock. No wolves came, no bears came, no lions came. Yeah, but you didn't feed the flock and now they're all dead. <laughs> oh, well. Or I entertained the flock. Again, that's a big thing nowadays, right? I entertained the flock. But you didn't feed the flock. You didn't nourish the flock. Paul is saying it's one and the same thing. That, that those who shepherd, oversee, watch the flock, pastors, elders, they're not just to be hawks, but they're also to nourish, to take care of, to feed the flock. And now in verse 12, Paul is going to speak exactly what these gifts are for, what really all the gifts are for. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry... For the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now when we think of gifts in the church, 
especially in our Western church, we typically think of someone doing something while everyone else watches, like y'all are doing right now. And then you go home and you talk about how good that person's gift is, and you can't wait till next week to see them do it again. But see, that's not the purpose of the gifts the Lord has given. The same thing is like with worship. Oh, I really love so-and-so's worship when they do worship. And, it, and all we're talking about is them and their gift and their worship and their this and their that or their teaching or their, their hospitality or their this or their that, whatever it might be. But that's not the purpose of the gift that the Lord has given. The gifts are to be used to equip others to use their gifts. When we see someone else using their gift, like I, I spoke about with Aaron, I wasn't just like, whew, Aaron's great. If I ever have any un- unsaved friends, I'm just going to send them, his, send them there, his way. No, but it spurred me on to realize I need to use my gifts. I need to find my gift. I need to find my, w- w- where the Lord is calling me to right now. But too often, when we come to church, when we come to um and even, you know, uh, over the years I've been um, not a fan of that, that language. Coming, I'm going to church. I'm coming to church. As if it's some place, some event. But church is not an event where there's an audience. And, and again, so many times it, it, it's not the people's fault so much as it's, it's, the, it's the people putting it on, putting on the show separating, you know, the stage is this high, so no one can get up there unless you have backstage access. You can't even look at the pastor because he's got like, you know, he's in his car bubble thing that he drives around. And they're viewed as superstars. And and they're the ones with the gifts. And I'm going to this event where I can watch someone's gifts be used. And I can just stand there and say, wow, their gifts are being used. That's awesome. Now certainly there's some, some blame to be on the people putting it on. But there's blame for those sitting there. Willingly being an audience member rather than a participant. But see, church is not an event where there's an audience, but it's the training grounds for the war that we face every day. When, if you're ever in the military, I wasn't, so I can't speak from first-hand experience, but I can speak um, from second and third-hand experience. <laughs> when you go to boot camp, you can't just tell your drill sergeant, yeah, I just like to watch today. I just like to watch what you guys are doing and just, you know, pat Billy on the back for his good shooting skills. And I'll come back next week, I'll just watch. No, you're getting trained for war and that drill sergeant, those other people training you are training you so that if you're at war, you have their back too. They want to make sure that you can shoot straight. They want to make sure that you have their back. They want to make sure you know what to do in the stressful situations. And that's what church is for. It's not just, I'm just going to, you know, just watch today. I'm just going to pat so-and-so on the back for the gifts that, that, that God's using through them. The gifts that we have is to prepare others. And the gifts others have is to prepare you. And that's very important to understand. That we're using, when we're using our gifts, it's not about us. All right, let me get up there and let me show them how great of a teacher I am this week. And then they're all going to want to come back next week because they're not going to find another one better. No, um, Pastor Chuck Smith, the one who founded Calvary Chapel, he was amazing at that, at, at the opposite of that. In fact, um, we had a friend who worked as a janitor um, in the 80s at Co- Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Um, and uh, and Romaine, who is uh, Chuck's uh, assistant pastor, he, w- he was a former Marine drill sergeant. <laughs> um, he went up to him and he, and he tells him, You've got, uh, I'm putting you on two weeks. You need to find something to do, something else to do. I'm firing you. 
Because like you've just been sitting around here too long, just sitting on your hands, just you know, being in this bubble of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. You need to go out and you need to serve the Lord. Chuck was not afraid to let his best teachers and preachers and worship leaders go because he knew that was his purpose in raising them up. That's what the Lord has, as I know, has put on my heart, is that this would be a place where people are raised up and sent out. I mean, we, we all know here in the South, in the Savannah area, the lack of living water out there. There are certainly other churches doing that. We, we aren't the only one. I praise the Lord for that. But there, there are cities, towns that have really nothing in terms of the word, in terms of a, a body practicing like this. When we understand that the gifts we have is so that others would go and use their gifts, or, or even the opposite, that when we see other people using their gifts, it's not to clap, it's not to pat them on the back, but it should be like, okay, I need to use my gift now. I see them using their gift. Now I want to do the same thing. It should spur us on. Paul also says here in these verses that the gifts are also in place so that we can grow closer to Christ and become more like Him. In fact, he says here that Christ's perfection is what we're measured up to, that that is our goal. You know, when, when you're doing like a diet or, or, or a tra- or a, um, working out, they, they say, well, just make little small goals. You know, do things that you know you can do. Not so with Christ. <laughs> Christ says, this is the goal, perfection. Be holy for I am holy. Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's not like a, well, I just don't want to not say anything bad today. <laughs> Christ says, be perfect. We, we know that perfection is not going to happen in this life. But that is our goal. That's what we strive for. That's what we, we, we long for. That is the purpose of coming together as a body and having our gifts worked out amongst each other. That it would make us more like Christ. In relation to what Paul said at the beginning of the chapter, if we are to walk worthy of our calling, then we need to be using our gifts amongst the body of Christ to spur them on to use their gifts and to grow us closer to Christ, to make us more like Christ every day. Not to to get an applause, not to say we're the best church, not to say we're the, the the coolest church, nothing like that. But it should be glorifying the Lord and growing us closer to Him. And then in verse 14, he continues... That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. I mean, the villains. <laughs> One last reason that Paul makes for the gifts, especially the gifts that are listed here. And again, he's specifically talking about a lot of oversight and leadership in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It's so that we would know sound doctrine. And when we know our doctrine, which is what the Bible says, that's what doctrine is, then we will not be like those that are easily swayed by the new spiritual snake oil that comes around and tries to fool believers and get their eyes off of Christ. As he says here, we're not be away children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Somewhere else in the New Testament, I can't remember it now, but it speaks of a wave being tossed to and fro. You know, just wherever, we're, wherever the wind's blowing this week, that's, where, that's the way we're going. Oh, that new book came out and said this, well, then that's the way we're going. Well, oh, the new book next week comes out and says something totally different. Well, that's the way we're going. That's the secret formula. That's how we are successful. Paul says that 
when our gifts are being used, when they're being used properly for the edifying of the church, for the equipping of the saints, then when bad doctrine comes in, we'll know it. We'll easily be able to spot it. We won't be tossed to and fro. We'll be the man, as Tim said, the man whose house is planted on the firm foundation. And when the storm comes, nothing is, he does not move. He's not tricked. In fact, those that are caught up in these things are usually the ones that are not part of a body. You know, I don't go to a church. You know, we're all the church. And so, you know, I work with a couple Christians. We never talk about our faith, but I work with a couple Christians. And, you know, that's my church. Or I listen to the Christian radio, that's my church. Or I listen to a podcast or a video sermon, and that's my church. Typically the ones that are carried about in these things, caught up in these things, are ones that are not part of a body. And when I say part of a body, I don't mean that their their name's not on a membership role. I mean that they're not actually taking part. They're not an active member of the body of Christ. See, in the New Testament, when it's there, there is no... Speaking of someone who just shows up and is an audience member. Again, going back to that. And yet, again, we, we sometimes how we even speak about church. Going to church. Planning your visit to a church. I, I've always said, I didn't know church was Disneyland where you had to plan your visit and find the park. And you, I mean, it's the body of Christ. If you're a Christian, then you should be welcome. You should know. You shouldn't have to read the list of what to bring. <laughs> What to expect. But typically the ones caught up in things, they're not part of a body. They're not practicing their gifts. And they're not taught the word and they usually don't read the word either. So Paul is saying here that the gifts are are not just beneficial to use our gifts, but they're beneficial so that way we can be equipped and we can be protected. And then in verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now he just spoke about doctrine. He just said we need sound doctrine. We need that so we're not tossed to and fro. And typically people think doctrine is this cold and empty fact that we know. Well, I know what the Bible says and this is what it says. But doctrine is is the maturity, the knowing that we need to grow closer to Christ. When you know your doctrine, when you know your theology isn't like, I know this and now I'm good. Typically, your doctrine and theology, if it's good, (laughs) will point you right back to Christ and saying, I'm not good. I need Him. He must increase and I must decrease. I don't have it all together. I I know all this stuff, but really, in reality, I know nothing. (laughs) Just like when the Lord is interviewing Job. When Job, you know, Job was wise man, rich man, great man. And yet, God tells him, you don't know anything, Job. (laughs) But sometimes we can have this cold doctrine, but Paul says, no, it needs to be done in love. We need to speak the truth in love. Without love, we're a clanging symbol. The gifts that we have are to be done in love. Because it'd be really easy for me to get up here and say, you need to do this and you need to do that. And... But the Bible says it needs to be done in love. Now, if you are joining the military, don't tell your drill sergeant that. Well, you just need to do. You just need to encourage me in love. <laughs> He'd love to encourage you by push-ups, probably. But see, that's what makes us different than the world, right? We do it in love. See, when we do all this, when we love one another and exercise our gifts for the equipping of the saints, then the church grows. 
And this is the growth that the Lord desires from us. Not the horizontal growth. Not the, you know, oh, we need to make sure we can fit more seats in here just in case. We need to do this. But it's the upward growth. The vertical growth. Us growing closer to the Lord, as he says here, that we grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, as the the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 12. The world's growth says that they would rather have 10,000 people who don't know what they believe than 10 people who love the Lord and use their gifts to build others up. But, as he says here in verse 16, this is only done when we're all doing our part. Notice in, in verse 16, from whom the whole body, the whole body, now he's going he's gonna to speak very general, and it's on purpose, because he wants to make sure no one is excluded if you're a believer. Whether you're a believer a week old or 40 years young in Christ. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what? Every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Paul is is emphatically saying that every believer needs to take part in the body of Christ. Every believer. That as he says in verse 7, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift that God has given you a gift to use for the equipping of the saints. That's the point of the church, equipping the saints. And it sounds harsh, but it's not to reach the lost necessarily. We do that. We will do that. That's something you will do. But the point of the church is to equip the saints so that we can go out and reach the lost. This building is not where people are met by the Lord, but it's out there. So we come in here as training grounds so you can go out there and fight the war and reach the lost, do the work of an evangelist, but we all do it. It's not, well, that's their job. That's his job. That's her job. That's her gift. I don't have a gift. God hasn't given me a gift. That's a lie from the enemy. By grace, not of your, work, not of your own works, Christ has given you a gift to be used in the body of Christ. And it's necessary. It's necessary. It's not even just like, yeah, I'd just like you to get more involved, buddy. It's necessary to the body of Christ. We need it. Every single one of you, we need it. We don't need you. But we need your gift the Lord has given you. And we cannot do it alone. It's not one person's job to have the body working together. It's not my job to get up here and and just, almost like I just said, tell you all, this is all right, you need to do this, you need to do that. I need to make sure everyone... This is something we're all supposed to strive for. When we're all joined and knit together. All right, The, The pastor isn't the center. The worship leader isn't the center. The elders are not the center. But Christ is the center. And He holds us all together. So in closing this morning, you have a gift that the Lord has graciously given you according to His riches, but are you using it properly? Are you using it to spur others on? Or when you see the gifts of others being used, does it spur you on to use your own? Or are you just sitting there as an audience member? There's no audiences in in boot camp. We're all to take part. See, Christ did not descend in ascend, descend in the earth and then ascend into heaven so that we can get a free ride to heaven. But He desires to see us grow into Himself and be more like Him. And when He desires that, He's given ourselves and the people around us gifts so that we can do that. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for the gifts You've given. Lord, You have blessed this body with amazing gifts. now I'm just excited to see how you continue to use people for the equipping of the saints, for the edifying of the body, to grow people people closer to you. 
And so, Lord, we ask right now that if any of us do not know our gifts, Lord, that we know that you're, you're not going to hide them from us. It's not a game to you. We don't have to climb Mount Everest to find out what our gift is, Lord. Um, but just like with the Holy Spirit, you're a good Father. And when we ask, you're faithful and just to, uh, faithful to give us those things. You're a good Father. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to use people, Lord, here in this body whether it's here in this building or when we're outside of this building, that we would be using our gifts properly, not to build ourselves up, but to build you up and to build others up, to use their gifts. Lord, and we also pray for anyone who doesn't know you. They don't even have the gift of salvation, the free gift. That just like with our gifts that we have in Christ, there's no gift that we have that is built upon our works. But it's all built upon your work that you've done, Lord. So we pray for anyone who doesn't know you, that they would, your Holy Spirit would save them, Lord. They would repent and turn to you, knowing it's not of their own works, but it's yours. The work you did on the cross. And we pray for those of us now who who have our gifts, that you would continue to, to keep our eyes off you, keep pride out of our hearts, Lord when we're using our gifts. Keep our eyes off ourselves and let us look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, the head, the center, the one who joins and knits us together. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, why don't we...